So my name is Sivakant, and I'm a product manager at AWS uh, on this service that we launched yesterday morning, uh, CloudTrail. And I'm super excited to, uh, to be here before you and share the details about our service. Uh, today's I'll, I'll quickly go into today's agenda. We'll start with the customer feedback that we received that actually prompted us to build a service. I'll talk about the high-level details of the service, and then I'll do a quick demo on how to turn on CloudTrail. And you can uh, walk through along with me. And if you have your laptops along with you, feel free to jump in and uh, turn on CloudTrail for your accounts. And then we'll go into the events that are recorded and delivered by CloudTrail. We will, we'll look at an, an event and uh, uh, what the anatomy of an event looks like. Then we will, uh, we will, have, a part, we will have our partners demo uh, their solutions that they've built on top of the, of the data that is generated and produced by CloudTrail. Uh, then we will move into advanced features, uh, and then we will have time for Q&A. If you have a burning question that you can't wait for, please feel free to ask me. But if you, I, I believe we will have enough time in the end to cover Q&A. So here is some of the specific and pointed feedback that we received from our customers. Um, the feedback, for example, is very clear. Add the ability to view all user activity that is API calls executed. So this is the, one of the pointers that where, we, where we started with. And another piece of feedback is, hey, we have a lot of uh, regulatory requirements that actually require us to store this uh, activity events slash API calls for a period of time of our choice. So help us create an archive of all these user activity events to meet our internal and external compliance standards. So we acted on this feedback and came up with AWS CloudTrail, which we announced earlier this morning. You probably, some of you probably who have uh, attended Steve's uh, session may have seen this slide, but just for the sake of uh, completeness, I'll go through this one more time. So you guys are making a lot of API calls to a lot of services across the regions, and you're doing this from multiple clients, CLI, uh, the AWS Management Console, or higher level services such as Beanstalk and CloudFormation, or OpsWorks. And CloudTrail is continuously recording these API calls you're making and delivering log files to you. This is a one pager that you can take away today and, and, can, be, and can think of CloudTrail and, and can have this on the back of your mind when you leave this session. Use cases enabled by CloudTrail, and you probably have heard about the tweets, you've seen the tweets, you've seen the blogs, talk about security analysis, compliance aid, uh, which are very popular use cases. But there are two other use cases that, are, that really, really are super interesting. For example, uh, troubleshooting operational issues. Uh, if you're actually troubleshooting an operational issue, you may want to go and take a look at whether something has recently changed in your environment and whether that change is actually the reason why you're facing an operational issue. Uh, CloudTrail is going to be super valuable because you have the events delivered to you in a log file, and you would be able to go take a, take a look at the events when you, have, when you have an operational issue, when you're troubleshooting an issue, and can easily roll back a change if actually it is the uh, source of the uh, operational issue that you're facing. You can also track changes to AWS resources. So for example, you could look at the set of events and say, when a particular AWS resource, such as a EC2 instance, was created or terminated or actually stopped and rebooted and so on and so forth. So these are, these are some of the use cases that are, very, um, that are enabled by CloudTrail. And I really think that the operational issues is the, is the coolest one. So now that I've uh, given a brief overview of the use cases, let me tell you what CloudTrail functionally is. CloudTrail records API calls in your account and delivers, that, delivers those API calls as events in a log file to your S3 bucket. And multiple partners have uh, today announced integrated solutions to analyze log files. So we have approximately 11 partners. We have 11 partners, not approximately. We have 11 partners that have uh, announced integrations uh, with CloudTrail. The log files are delivered approximately every five minutes. And this is super important because the log files are not being delivered every four hours or, or like at the end of the day, because you now get, have the ability to actually take actions based on the log files that are delivered to you. 
And an event is typically delivered within 15 minutes of the actual API call that was made. So we have a lot of services at AWS, and out of the gate, uh, CloudTrail supports uh, the most, core, most important core services, EC2, EBS, RDS, Redshift, VPC, IAM and security token service, STS, and CloudTrail itself. So we do log and record the activity that is made against our own API calls. And as I mentioned before, we also, it, uh, most of you use higher level services such as CloudFormation and OpsWorks or Beanstalk to actually create your web applications or to create your own templates or to create your, your own templates and uh, stacks. So we do record, CloudTrail records those API calls as well. And uh, you should expect that we will be adding more services in the future, and you can actually provide us feedback through the AWS forums. We have a forum on uh, AWS forums, CloudTrail forum. You can go in there and can tell us what services that are most important to you, and that will help us prioritize our roadmap. So now we've talked about what is recorded and delivered. I also want to briefly talk about what is not recorded by CloudTrail. State transitions of AWS resources. Um, what do you mean by state transitions? So when you create resources on, at AWS, for example, an EC2 instance, it is put into a pending state, and then that resource creation process takes a few minutes, and as it completes, the resource moves into a running state. So that pending to running state is not an API call, it's an asynchronous operation that is happening in the background that is not captured. A load are denied traffic information for VPC security groups and ACLs. So you create rule, security group rules and NACLs to define what traffic should be allowed and what traffic should be denied. So CloudTrail doesn't capture the traffic, the network flow that is allowed or denied based on the, virtue, based on the definition of that security group rule or the ACL that you've defined. And finally, the console sign-in events. The console sign-in events are the events that occur when you enter your username and password and hit enter. And the API calls that occur after you sign in are all recorded. Just the sign-in event itself is not recorded by CloudTrail. So regional availability today, uh, as some of you have turned on CloudTrail, so you must have noticed that CloudTrail is available today in US East, Northern Virginia, and US West, Oregon regions. And CloudTrail is a regional service. What, what it means to be a regional service is you turn it on in every region that you use. Uh, similarly, we have a different, bit, different kind of service that we, call, we refer to them as global services. A global service is not in one particular region. You use a single endpoint to make API calls to that particular service. For example, IAM. You make an IAM API call to iam.aws.amazon.com is the endpoint. So it's region agnostic. But CloudTrail will deliver all those, if, if you're using all your resources, such as EC2 or RDS, in US West Oregon, CloudTrail will record those events that are going to the single endpoint for IAM in US East and deliver those logs to your bucket in US West or anywhere else. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have 11 partners that have uh, integrated solutions with, the, with, with CloudTrail, and uh, we have some demos coming up, uh, some very cool stuff. And now that I think it's, now that you have a high level view, I wanna take a minute to actually go into my account and show you guys how simple it is to turn, turn on CloudTrail. Oops. So here I am, I'm already logged into the AWS Management Console, and the first time you're actually going into the CloudTrail Console, you will see a splash screen. Oops. Okay. Have you restricted this? Oh, 
Hold on one second. I, it's, it's coming. How do I switch in? It's there? All right, um, we'll just continue with this and we'll get back, uh, ask you that you stay here so that we, so because this is gonna be just a couple of seconds, I would actually go with this resolution, excuse me, and uh, um, so you would see a splash screen um, that actually provides details about what the service does. And then you get started, and you would see that you have the option to create a new bucket or use an existing bucket. And here I'm actually going to use a new bucket, and I would actually go ahead and say new test for CT US West 2, and I'll go ahead and create the bucket. But before I do that, I also want to talk about the fact that you can actually choose an existing bucket if you wanted to do so. The only caveat is you have to apply the policy on an existing bucket if you're choosing to use an existing bucket. And then here is an advanced section, which we will talk about more in the advanced, uh, in the advanced features of this presentation. Um, for now, I'll skip on that, and I'll go hit subscribe. So it does its magic, and saying the S3 bucket is this particular one, and including global services by default, and I'm not getting any notifications. So now let's go back. Once I've turned on CloudTrail, CloudTrail will start delivering events in log files to my S3 bucket. Let's go look at what these events will look like, uh, and we'll switch back to the presentation here. Okay. Uh, where's that? All right. Thank you. So what, what, what does CloudTrail actually record, and what is in an event? An event consists of a uh, uh, lot of information. It starts with a user identity element, who made the API call, when was the API call made, what was the API call, and what are the resources that are acted upon on that, in that API call, and, the, and, and where was that API call made from. You can take, think of it as the five W's that are answered using an, that can be answered using an event. And all the, the event is in a JSON format, so it's very dynamic, and you can actually use, uh, it, can, it is very easily parsable. So we'll, we'll go through these in detail about all these five W's, and I'll start with who, because it provides a lot of rich information. And um, it, we have multiple identity types with an IAM, with an AWS IAM. So the root user is one of the uh, identity type. Similarly, IAM users, federated users, and roles. So CloudTrail records detailed identity information for all these different AWS identity types. And the information includes friendly username and the AWS access key ID. The AWS access key ID is, uh, or you have a very important use case here. So for example, from time to time, you may want to retire certain AWS access key IDs. And you don't know whether they are still in use or not. You want to go back into these log files and say, okay, I want to actually see whether this particular access key ID is in use or not before I actually retire that access key ID. So you can now do that. You can just take a particular set of log files and see whether that access key ID is still in use. And you get other detailed, inf other important information like the account numbers, the Amazon resource names, also called as ARNs. And then there is a specific information for federated users and roles, which are session context and, se and session issuer information. As I talked before, 
uh, there are high-level services that you use to actually make, uh, to actually create AWS resources. For example, uh, CloudFormation and Beanstalk. So when those particular resources are acting on your behalf, we do, I, we do record that in a specific section called invoked by, so that you know that this particular API call was invoked by particular AWS service on behalf of a user. And we'll go into examples here and talk more about them. So first example, in this example, Bob, an IAM user, is actually making an API call, and the user identity element is going to look uh, like this. You will have, you'll see an access key ID, and then you'll see that the type of the user is IAM user, and the username is Bob, and you'll also be able to see the principal ID, which is a unique identifier for Bob. And then we have another example, a federated user. In this case, Alice, the federated user, as you can see the type is a federated user, is making an API call with this particular access key ID, AS example, blah, and you'll also see that there is a session issuer information, which actually is telling you that Bob, the IAM user on this account, actually gave those temporary credentials to the federated user, Alice, who is actually making this call. So this is really detailed information that helps you understand who actually gave those credentials, not only just who is actually acting in that API call. And this is another example of an AWS service uh, of user identity in which an AWS service is actually making an API call on behalf of a user. So Bob is creating um, a particular web application using Elastic Beanstalk. So the invoke by section here clearly identifies that Elastic Beanstalk is the one that is making this, action, making this API call on behalf of user Bob. So as, we, as I mentioned before, we have partners, we've been working with partners to actually visualize this data and enable rich use cases on top of this data. Um, one of our partners, Splunk, has built a nice and rich query interface that helps you actually dig deeper into the user activity and, and provide more um, uh, rich analysis. Uh, we have uh, Gerald Kanapati here, the Director of uh, Business and Technical Services at Splunk. Gerald, how are you? Very good. Is he mic'd up? Good. There we go. Fantastic. Well, while I get set up here, we'll uh, get him going. Let's get back on the network. Just getting back on the network again. Okay. So what um, Gerald and uh, team have done is. Uh, when, when you guys were in Seattle a couple of weeks ago, you showed us, is it on? Over. Yeah, it's just on six. All right. All right, there we go. All right, cool. So when you guys were in Seattle a couple of weeks ago, you showed us how we can actually zoom in into a particular user mm -hmm. and do rich queries on top of that particular user and see what he or she has been doing. Yep. Can you show, that, show, show, show us it one more time? Sure, I can do that. Um, but before I do that, just, uh, just a bit of background here. Um, so for those who don't know, Splunk is a platform for analyzing, um, uh, collecting, and visualizing log and other machine-generated data. Um, what we've done, we worked with the team up in Seattle uh, to create an app on top of our platform. Um, what this app does is it takes uh, some of the knowledge that we've gotten from the team about what's useful, what's important, and what users want to see, and built out dashboards, forms, and other things to help people who don't have a deep knowledge of what the cloud trail logs look like to still be able to get useful information and insights into their, you know, into their cloud trail logs. Okay. Right. So how do customers uh, get these log files into Splunk? Do they, do they have to do anything, or they just turn this app and all the log files start showing up or directly ingested by Splunk? That's so it. They just configure the, um, they configure the settings uh, that, they've, that, they've, you know, that, that you've walked through for enabling CloudTrail, tell Splunk what those are, and the data will start showing up in Splunk. Okay, and they don't have to continuously download S3 uh, files from S3 nope, and upload Splunk. them? Nope, our inputs take care of all okay. that. Okay, very yeah. cool. So going back to the user activity uh, use case that we, you, you, you demonstrated to us a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, can you p take a particular user and show us what, the, what it looks like if we wanted to go in time and over a particular horizon, time horizon? Sure. Um, 
you know, you can always, uh, as Splunk, advanced Splunk users can always use Splunk's native capabilities, but we've created this simplified form for people who just want to, for example, see the history of what uh, my user account did. Um, simply a drop down of the existing users, uh, and I can view them and limit them to a particular date or time range, okay. say before, uh, between yesterday and today. Okay. Uh, and it gives me a history of what my, uh, what, what my account's been doing. It looks like I've been deleting users, creating policies, deleting volumes. Actually, these are all just scripts that are running, so I had data to show, but okay. it works. Okay, and one of the things um, that our customers have repeatedly told us is, hey, if we have um, authorization failures that are occurring in our account, we want to know that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, just to be very clear what authorization failures are. Authorization failures occur when a user who has successfully authenticated logs in or either through the console or an API and tries to do something and uh, uh, tries to make an API call that he or she is not permitted to. So these are super important sure. uh, for, a lot, for almost all of our large and uh, uh, extra large customers. Yep. And can you show whether there are authorization failures that have occurred sure. on this account and how they sure. would apply? Sure. Um, as it turns out, uh, we, we recognize they're important, and so we've actually broken out um, failures of actions into a uh, different part of the same form. So the same form will actually, do, uh, will actually bring this up. If you want to look closer, I have a test account that does nothing but create authorization failures, and we'll see that he's listed out, and it shows us access denied and unauthorized operations, along with the details. Okay. And... When you were actually coming out of this query screen, mm -hmm. I did see a snapshot of uh, a map. Yep. Is there a map that actually shows where this authorization failures or the successful uh, calls were being made? Yep, this is what you saw on the opening screen. It gives us an overview of uh, the geographic sources of all calls, um, and it does break them down by authorized and unauthorized in this case. So we can see that we've got a large number of unauthorized act uh, actions coming out of the uh, Singapore AWS region. So the, this, this actually gives the customers, hey, why is this particular an idea of where this activity is coming from yep. geographically and can zoom in and see yep. whether that activity is, should be occurring or not be occurring. Exactly, and using that, you can then use the rest of the, further some of the other dashboards and other Splunk capabilities to investigate in greater detail why those might be um, occurring and where they're coming from. Good. So how can our customers, AWS and Splunk customers, download this app? Do they have to do something right, right now? Um, well, existing Splunk customers can simply go to the Splunk app store, apps.splunk.com, download it for free today. Uh, ones who, uh, anyone who's not a Splunk customer can go to the AWS marketplace, launch a Splunk AMI, and then from inside that, um, go to the GUI, um, and add, and again, add the apps from the app store to that install. Great. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you. I think I am on now. It's marked. There you go. I'm back. Great. Thanks again, Gerald. Thank you. So now um, we've talked about um, the, in detail about the user identity and who. Uh, I want to switch gears and talk about other information that is available in the API calls, that, that, that is available in the events that are recorded. Um, so Time is an important aspect of the API call that was made. So we, CloudTrail records the time and date of the event in an ISO 8601 format. And the, the, the ISO 8601 format is the most, uh, the unambiguous and well-defined method of representing date and time. And a higher level or presentation level services can, presentation level applications can convert the time into a desired time zone. And another important aspect is um, the, the time needs to be synced and, and be accurate. So all the AWS services sync all systems clock, system clocks with an internal uh, and centralized network time protocol server so that we provide accurate time in, this, in, in an event. So um, moving on from time to what exactly is the API call and what resources were acted upon. And there's a rich, rich information uh, in, in these um, request parameters and response elements returned by an AWS service. The request parameters correspond to the parameters that were passed by, a by, the, by the requester when he or she is making the API call. 
the mandatory and the optional parameters. And response elements are the elements that are returned by the AWS service. So for example, when you make a run instances call to create three or four or 20 instances, the particular API call returns an instance set with rich information about that uh, API, about, that, about those instances. So uh, all that information is made available in that event. In the case of um, read-only API calls, by read-only API calls, I mean describes, gets, and lists. Uh, CloudTrail does not record the response elements. The reason being, if there is an account, or, uh, or there's an account that has 250 instances or 4,000, 4, you could do a describe instances and can get a response element that is probably very large in size in the order of megabytes. And given that the describes are more frequent in nature than the, um, than the, no, than the, than the creates or the updates of the deletes, we do not record them uh, to keep the event size low. We still provide all other information intact so that you still have a meaningful event of who actually is making these calls. I also wanna bring in one of our partner, Boundary, who has done, um, who has taken this rich information in the response elements and uh, built a use case and helps you troubleshoot operational issues. Uh, I have Dustin Lawler here from uh, Boundary, Director of Technical Services. Hi, how are you? Dustin, great to have you here. Great being here. And I think uh, we're gonna switch on to six. So Dustin, um, you were, you, when you were demonstrating last week, you showed us something where when there is a network spike, network traffic spike occurs, you would automatically get an email that actually tell, talks, that tells you when and when, when that traffic spike has occurred, and you can actually correlate that back to an event. Can you talk a little bit more and show us? Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm gonna start off here. What you're looking at is this is an actual notification that Boundary sent out. So Boundary, there's a couple of use cases that we can tackle. The thing that we're looking at here is we've detected some anomalous activity. We've taken that, we've posted this email notification. I can actually move from this email notification directly into our event console. Once I'm in the event console, I can see, here's some additional details about the actual event so we can see there is a, an, some unexpected SSH activity. I can then take it from here and moving from the event console, hitting view and stream, I can further orient myself around the actual event. So again, the, the event's just part of it, right? So it's a matter of, okay, well, here's the event, but moving into the streams, I can actually visualize what the, in, uh, what the impact of this event was. So coming in here, we can see, okay, here's the actual notification. And knowing the notifications there, that, that's one thing. But better yet, what I can do is I can go back a little bit in time and I can say, what actually caused this notification? So you can see we've annotated all the events coming from our own service and coming here from CloudTrail. So I can come in and I can visually identify, here's the notification we received from the service. Hovering over this event, we can see the specific API call that was issued to make the change. So in this okay. case, we can see authorized security group ingress. Selecting this, I pivot back to the events. As I move back to the events, I can go through and I can see some additional stats about the event. So again, I can see things such as who the, uh, the actual user was that made the change. I can see the port that was impacted. So as we saw from the alert, SSH 22, the IP range, and then some additional stats such as the security group. Okay, so if you scroll down a little bit, um, Dustin. Sure. So what you're saying is that 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0 0, the IP CRDR block is the one that was actual, the actual change. Absolutely. And now that we have identified what the change was, can we go back and remediate this quickly? We can. So what we can do is we can actually take this event, we can use this as a jumping off point to go into the AWS console. Okay. So pulling this up here, you can see we've, we've enriched the event. So we move from boundary directly into the console. As the console comes up, we can see we're placed right into the security groups. And I can take this and I can filter down further. I, Again, I had identified what the security group was from the event, okay. and I can go through here, and I can actually uh, revoke the, uh, um, the, uh, the opening of this port. I okay. can remove that. Cool, and once you revoke, can we go back into boundary and actually see that the traffic has now subsided? Yeah, we, we it can. Is back to normal? Yeah, so what I can do is, again, just to visualize the event to ensure that we've actually made the change, the changes uh -huh. taken effect, moving into here, I can go back in, 
And I can say, okay, well, show me only those events related to this particular security group. Selecting on this here, this is a, a tag. So this tag we're effectively using as a quick filter. Mm -hmm. We go in. Here we've identified the actual change that I just made. So we can see just from the event, everything appears to be fine. But again, if we want to further ensure that this, this event is actually, uh, you know, stop the SSH traffic, I can move from here back into the streams. Okay. And then from here, we can visualize, here were SSH 22, where we had popped up with traffic, and again, we can see where it dropped based off of the actual change that we made. So we've closed the loop. Cool. So how can customers take advantage of this? Yeah, so what you can do is we're actually going to be, we have a booth here, we're at 1020. Anyone who wants to come out, we're doing live demos the entire time that we're here. We also have a free sign up to be part of our beta program. We're SaaS, so you can sign up and get going right away. Pretty cool. Yeah. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you. So um, we'll move on to the more, uh, more richer information that is still we need, still we need to cover. And uh, one of the important piece of information that is available. Oh, am I not hooked up? Sorry about that. Um, moving on, one of the rich information that is available in the, in the event is the, the apparent IP address itself. The reason why I call it apparent IP address is because proxies and firewalls can obscure the IP address of the, the actual IP address of the requester. In the case of the management console, which is also a proxy uh, through which a customer or a user is actually making the API calls, we are able to record the apparent IP address of the requester on his source machine. So we do make that, uh, we do record that. So for example, you can see that the source IP address in which was my desktop in this case. And you would see that, you would also see that the particular region the API call was made to. So if you're using a regional service and you're sending that to a particular endpoint in a particular region, that AWS, that AWS region information will be captured. In the case of global services, like IAM and SGS, as we have discussed, the AWS region will be recorded as US East 1, where those services are located. And finally, we do capture errors and authorization failures, as you've just seen. Uh, errors correspond to the client error codes uh, and server error codes. Authorization failures are a specific example of client errors. And as, you, as I've um, talked before, these are super important to, uh, to our customers as, as this is the specific feedback that we've gotten that authorization failures need to be logged. So we've just covered uh, what exactly is in an event, and I wanna go deeper into some of the advanced topics that uh, uh, related to CloudTrail. We did talk about the compliance use case in the very beginning, and uh, what we have here is a, a list of standards that all of you can see, PCI, FedRAMP, and uh, ISO and SOC2. And our compliance team has worked on a great white paper that actually lists the specific controls in these, in these particular standards and, tell, and, and, and gives guidance on how to actually meet those logging requirements that are specified in those standards. So this, the white paper is titled Security at Scale, Logging in AWS, and this is live and you can access it through our facts and through our detail page as well. So I strongly encourage that you go take a peek at that and, and read it in detail when you have time. So one of the things that our customers have told us is, hey, this is great, you're going to generate these log files and you're gonna put them in S3, but really I need to go and continuously pull S3 to actually find out when log files have arrived. So we want, to, we want to actually have a mechanism by means of which we can actually know that a log file has been delivered to my S3 bucket so that I do not have to continuously pull S3. So what we have done is we have taken an SNS notification. We have taken an SNS topic of, uh, and we will publish a notification to an SNS topic. And now that SNS topic will have the address of the S3 object, which is nothing but the log file. So now you can directly and immediately take action by listening to the topic 
and you can subscribe multiple endpoints to the topic. So if you have two solutions that you're feeding the, you're, you're actually inputting these logs into, you could actually have two queues that are subscribed to a single SNS topic and, and, and have these input into multiple solutions. So we write, uh, CloudTrail writes the log files into S3. And, and we, once we actually started writing log files, how should the layout of the log files, uh, how should the layout of the S3, S3 look like? So in this example, you're seeing that there is a bucket, FMR in CloudTrail bucket, and then there is AWS logs. So when we were working on this entire naming convention, one of the things that our customers have told us is, hey, when I log into a Unix system, I actually go in, and I, by default, I would go into CD, war logs. It's almost like I don't even, it's second nature to me. I go in there, and I look at the messages file. I look at the other logs that I want to look at. Um, so we came up with a convention, the naming con a file, of a folder structure that is intuitive, and you can, log, you can always specify a bucket, and the files are going to be available in AWS logs, account number, the service that actually that generated the logs, and the region those logs belong to, and the time and date, uh, and the date actually those logs were generated. So this is particularly useful if you're aggregating logs across multiple accounts, or multiple regions, or both, because if you're using one bucket and you're aggregating logs, and if they're not arranged, in the future the access can become really difficult. So the descriptive folder structure will make it extremely easier to uh, store log files from multiple accounts. And, and the file name, as you can see, contains detailed information as well. The reason for having a detailed information, the file name is, when you move these log files from one S3 bucket to another, or you download them to your desktop, you still have a meaningful name. You can identify what the log file is for, very clearly. And you can see that the, you, the time actually is in the, in, is, is actually the timestamp is in the file name. So 2013, 1103, blah, blah, blah. So the time corresponds to the, um, the event that is in the chronological order. Uh, sorry, the first event in the chronological order. So that now you actually have 25 events or 40 events in a particular uh, log file. You can look at the time and say, oh, okay, this is where an actually a particular, this is where all the events will start in this particular log file. And you will also see that there is a random um, unique identifier that is generated. We do this because in, in a very remote scenario, a particular event can come out of order. And when that happens, if there is a log file where, which, on the same day, if you have a log file that, was, that has an event time that corresponds to the, exactly the same time, you could, you, could, you could actually have a log file overwritten. So to prevent that, we actually come up with a unique identifier so that there is no overwriting of log files. Right? So we talked about a little bit about why the, folder, why the folder structure is descriptive and why there's a default folder structure. And you can aggregate, the reason being, you can aggregate logs from multiple regions. So it's, it's very straightforward, logging, uh, aggregating logs from multiple regions. You create a bucket in the first region when you turn on CloudTrail. So CloudTrail will apply the appropriate policy, and the policy is put in place. And you switch, in the, in the, in the console, you would go and switch to the uh, second region right now, which could be US East or US West, Oregon. And you would just go to a drop down menu and say you would pick the same bucket that you have actually used in the first region. And CloudTrail will, and, and you subscribe. CloudTrail will deliver logs from both those regions or multiple regions to the same bucket in the future. You do the same thing for aggregating log files from multiple accounts into one S3 bucket. Um, so I'll use an example of account one for brevity. So you turn on CloudTrail for account one, as you would do for, as you would do normally. And then you would actually go ahead and update the bucket policy. So the, the, what you're doing here is you're basically giving consent for account two and account three, which are the, the accounts that you want to aggregate logs into the bucket foo for account one. 
So you would go ahead and open up your uh, S3 bucket policy editor, and you would update that bucket policy. And these are the two resources that you would add in there, and you would replace that with your own specific information, for example, the account number and the bucket name and the prefix that you have. And now you've authorized accounts two and three to actually send logs to account one. And you have to do this step before you turn on your Cloud Shell for accounts two and three. And today, you have to actually go and turn on CloudTrail for accounts two and three from the CLI. In the future, it will be supported from the console, but right now, it has to, the, turning on CloudTrail for accounts two and three, if you're using a bucket that doesn't belong to that account, you have to do, you have to do it from the CLI. So the final and the most important thing, the pricing, there are no charges to turn on CloudTrail, and the standard S3 and SNS charges will apply as per your usage. Um, there's a list of uh, partners, and we have SecondWatch, AlertLogic, Cognizant, and Logly, and Strackdriver, SumoLogic, who have a session, so feel free to attend the session or go by the booths. And we are ready to take Q&A. And the session ID is SEC 207, so please provide your feedback.